<laughs> All right, so today's presentation is um, on the um, analysis of, of social medias and Twitter in particular um, during the Hurricane Sandy. And it's um, okay, we have new performance from Canberra. Hello, Canberra. Can you hear us? All good? You can see the slides? Just sign or nod. Everything is good? Yeah. Alright, so I'll just give the floor to, to, to Yuri, who is uh, our new social expert for the <laughs> analysis of these digital traces of Hurricane Sandy on Twitter. Uh, okay, thank you, Victor. Uh, so, as you can see from the title slides, this is going to be about the uh, analysis of digital traces left by the Hurricane Sandy on Twitter. Uh, the project is done here within what used to be a disaster management team of the optimization research group. It's nowadays environmental and societal resilience team, if I'm not wrong. It's probably going to be something else tomorrow. Uh, so the, the wider theme of the, of the project itself is basically a combination of the disaster management uh, and computational social science. Uh, so the talk itself today is going to be very much uh, relaxed and descriptive, properly suited for the Friday lunch. Uh, it's going to be almost non-technical. Uh, in the true spirit of data science being mostly sums and averages. Uh, so, uh, if you've got any questions in the meantime, just uh, interrupt me on the spot. Uh, so, the content of the topic, I'll uh, start with a little introduction about actually uh, the uses of social media and Twitter, in particular uh, in disaster management. Uh, I'll describe a little bit of the context, uh, the hurricane. Excuse center. me, Yuri. Yes, we can. Ah, oh, now it's all right. We we were not able to see the slides. No, but okay, now now they appear. Okay, sorry. Okay. 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 Can, can you see the slides now? Yeah. Now it's all right. Yeah. Um, so, sorry for the interruption. I'll just plug in the power source just in case. So uh, I'll then continue on to the, basically given the general overview about the patterns in the online activity and uh, the major part of the talk would actually be uh, the project already completed which is the performance of the so-called sensor method uh, with respect to the kind of early awareness component of the, uh, of the social media use. Uh, so basically you're all aware that in, in recent years uh, social media became a very mature uh, and prominent information platform in itself. Uh, so especially for the younger generation and even respected sort of mainstream media uh, not only refer uh, to the social media but uh, frequently use it as a primary source for the, for the news cycle. Uh, and uh, it naturally attracts the uh, interest in context of uh, uh, catastrophes and disasters, what, what could be done and how the social media can be used. Uh, the uses of the social media broadly fall into several categories and uh, a couple of them are really obvious. Uh, it can be used for the dissemination and uh, the, the most prominent example of that is the latest uh, introduction of the Twitter alert capacity when the uh, responsible agencies like uh, FEMA and other disaster uh, management agencies basically disseminate the emergency information broadcasted to the subscribe users. Uh, the second one is obvious as well here is a situational awareness when basically the uh, ground report gets distributed and people get the uh, uh, most urgent uh, and relevant information. Uh, the last 
less obvious but very promising application is actually event detection. And uh, I put a couple of the examples of publications here uh, specific to Twitter. For instance, Twitter being used for actually monitoring and detecting earthquakes. Uh, it's been done in the United States and in Japan. And in one particular example, this paper on the left by Sakaki and his co-authors, they actually implemented a working system where based on basically on triangulation from, from the tweets, uh, they can pinpoint uh, location of the uh, earthquake and do it uh, almost 15 minutes earlier than the official uh, reports from the uh, seismic agency in Japan. It is, of course, probably the case of uh, uh, verification rather than actual precision and detection, uh, but nonetheless, uh, it can be done. Uh, so what we are focusing on is basically uh, trying to figure out uh, how the massive data set of the information collected from Twitter in relation to the large scale catastrophic event could be used uh, in the disaster management context. Uh, so to give you a little bit of the background about Hurricane Sandy, uh, I'm sure most of you are well aware uh, about the event. So it was the largest uh, hurricane of the uh, 2012 hurricane season in the Atlantic Basin. So uh, the storm formed uh, in the early days of the last decade of October, and by 22nd of October, it was actually officially classified as a main storm, uh, which later developed into the hurricane. Uh, so it actually persisted between 22nd and 29th uh, of October. Uh, originated uh, in the Caribbean Sea, uh, about 500 miles south southwest of uh, Jamaica. Uh, by the 24th uh, of October, it crossed Jamaica. On the next day, it crossed Cuba. Then it basically followed the coast of the United States and eventually made its landfall uh, near Brigantine in New Jersey, uh, with a wind force uh, of about 75 knots. Uh, it was an unusually large-scale hurricane which brought a significant storm surge along the coast of New Jersey, Connecticut, Maine, uh, with the prevalent levels of almost up to three meters. Uh, the storm surge was responsible for most of the damage. Uh, the damage was quite significant, so uh, all in all, approximately 650,000 uh, buildings were destroyed or damaged. Uh, about 8 million people were affected by the power losses, which uh, lasted in some places for weeks. Something that Carlton is probably going to fix really soon. Uh, uh, the hurricane caused directly about 150 uh, casualties and uh, indirectly uh, about the same number. And the estimated damage was about $50 billion for the United States alone. Uh, so that's kind of the scope of the disaster we're looking at. Um, now about the data, what do we have from on the hurricane? So the, the project started from the data set, which was basically a collection of the uh, messages uh, united by the use of the hashtag Sandy. Uh, that has about four uh, uh, and a half million tweets from roughly two and a half million users. Uh, the structure of the data is basically uh, the text itself plus a bunch of auxiliary information like the tweet ID, user ID, uh, naturally related timestamp where possible <coughs> the location, uh, latitude and longitude, uh, also the network information from connectivity information of a particular user, number of friends and followers, uh, the status of the message, whether it's original or repeated message, uh, and some other auxiliary information. Uh, to complement that, we basically extended our reach uh, uh, a bit uh, later in the project. So we complemented the original data set with what I call here the keywords data set. So besides the hashtag Sandy, the problem with the hashtag is they're not good sort of uh, consistently in every message. 
obviously. Uh, so we needed to extend um, our reach a little bit. So we started to looking at the messages we are sending using any form, not necessarily as a hashtag. Uh, plus, we added uh, the keywords like storm, hurricane, super storm, sandy, ranking storm, and the rest of the uh, names widely associated with the hurricane. Uh, we added the uh, what I call effect keywords or the consequence keywords, uh, which are flooding, uh, gas, and power, <coughs> to track the uh, interactions about the uh, infrastructure outages. So this additional keyword data set is uh, slightly over 48 uh, million tweets and all the years we're looking, we're looking roughly at 55 million messages. Uh, in our analysis, because we're dealing with the disaster which unfolds in, in time and space, we're looking at the geography as well. Uh, so we restrict ourselves to using only the messages with the location information. So we're only working with the geographic messages. And uh, the filtering for uh, messages with location information cuts down the volume of data roughly by half. So we're looking at 24 million messages. And we additionally implement the filters like we're looking only in US and Canada. So we save us uh, trouble working with different languages and time zones. And we also implement the relevance filtering, which I will describe in a little bit more detail. Uh, so all these filtering steps basically uh, trim down the data set to roughly 4.5 million messages from 1.4 million users. Uh, the geocoding step, uh, there's two kinds of procedures that we implement for getting the location uh, of the user. Uh, when the message is posted, the one is uh, conveniently provided by Twitter, uh, and that is kind of really precise location. The problem with that is uh, that it's rare because it requires explicit user permission to track uh, his or her location. And in fact, only less than 2% of messages are geocoded in this way. Uh, so we uh, had to implement a little bit of in-house post-processing for the uh, for the location. So the, the obvious way to do it was to look at the user profile information. So we extract in the address that the user self-reports in the in the profile, and we analyze the uh, location relevant keywords there, which could be uh, city, street, state, country, and so on. So the, there's a huge variation in the quality of this information. Uh, but if you forget about the quality, uh, the reach of such procedure is basically quite good. We were able to reconstruct location data for about 46% of the messages we had, and on the user basis, it's basically about 43% of the users we are looking at. Uh, so uh, we basically extract this location text, and then using Wolfram Alpha, we get the coordinates of whatever you precise street, be it a county or a center of the state, uh, depending on how lucky we are. Uh, so that was uh, filtering by the uh, location. The last step of filtering uh, we implemented is the filtering by relevance. And uh, that's kind of a price we pay for extending our reach besides the hashtag. Because when you start to look at the additional keywords, you get some uh, a lot of junk, not necessarily related to the event itself. Uh, as an example here, you can see the timeline of tweet of one particular user. Uh, and for us, the uh, time step of the first message is really important because uh, in the last section uh, of my presentation over about the sensor method, uh, I will describe it in more detail, but basically we're using the uh, entry time or the time of the first message is a proxy for the awareness. Uh, so we're making an assumption that the user basically tweets about the events uh, close in time to when he or she actually became aware about it. Uh, and uh, if this entry marker is determined incorrectly, then basically our assumption about awareness uh, are not really good. Uh, so, uh, Thankfully, 
actually the event itself was the hurricane. We know specifically when the uh, hashtag Sandy starts to make sense or the keyword Sandy because the hurricane was officially named from the 22nd of October and basically any level of the activity before that is uh, with high degree of probability is not related to the hurricane at all. So we got this reference point which is 22nd of October. And uh, to give you an example how this filtering affect the uh, the distribution of messages. Here is a typical histogram of tweeting, uh, and uh, you can see how you can see the daily variation. You can see the sharp peak on the landing day, uh, but you also can three different level uh, of filtering. So unfiltered stream with a significant activity before 22nd, which is on the scale of power, would be roughly three minus 200 hours. Uh, so the time scale, and it's going to be the same in the rest of my presentation, so we take the landing day uh, in landing time in New Jersey as a, uh, as a reference point, that would be zero hours, and uh, all the time is described basically as an offset in hours with respect to the particular date and time. So uh, the main date, which is the 22nd, is roughly minus 200. So the uh, moderate filtering basically includes uh, filtering, keeping only the sending itself plus the uh, clearly hurricane re related keywords like hurricane, superstorm, storm, superstorm sandy, cramping storm and so on. Uh, it is quite successful in suppressing the level of uh, unrelated activity. This is a blue trend in the plot, but, but it doesn't do the job completely. Uh, so in the end, we basically resorted to the kind of strict filter and we only include the messages that uh, have uh, sandy in either hashtag or keyword form anywhere in the text. And that is why it's successful in suppressing the activity prior to the main and day of the hurricane. Uh, so that basically concludes the section on description of the data, uh, and let's proceed to the general feature of the uh, behavior uh, with respect to the hurricane. So I basically described briefly the, the topical and regional analysis, uh, uh, touch on the patterns in the online activity, uh, describe the relationship between uh, activity originality and popularity of the content posted, and talk a little bit about the uh, retweet distribution by region and uh, by the success rate or the length of the uh, retweet chain. Uh, and also with the respective changes in, in these characteristics with, uh, with the stages of the hurricane. Uh, so the topic of the regional dimension that we're looking at is uh, we're basically looking at 50 most populous metropolitan areas and states according to the 2010 census. And uh, uh, on the left, you can see the table of the keywords uh, in our extended data set uh, with their respective counts. Uh, many of them are actually duplicate each other. Uh, so we trim that down to 20 unique uh, keywords and using the uh, sort of most popular of them. Uh, I'll start with the general uh, trend uh, shown in the activity, and that's on the right. You can see the uh, activity expressed as number of messages per user uh, uh, over time. And that essentially behaves the same as the, as, as the plot I showed previously. Uh, it starts uh, around, it starts building up uh, between minus 100, uh, minus 200 and 100 hours, and uh, it peaks sharply on the landing day, and then it falls off. This particular example is a keyword Sandy. On other keywords, uh, on some of them, you can see additionally uh, peak, like for instance, if we were looking at the power, uh, you can detect a peak uh, uh, roughly on the 7th of November, corresponding to the another storm coming to the northeast. If we're looking for gas, it's going to be peaking uh, rather than on the landing day, it 
will be featured in a couple of weeks afterwards, uh, associated with the power outages and the uh, shortages in fuel and so on. Uh, the question is, uh, <coughs> what is the simplest way to rationalize this behavior? And it basically turns out to be direct relevance of the event or profit to the users. Uh, and in this particular uh, example, the most obvious proxy for the relevance is basically the uh, distance or the proximity to the disaster zone. Uh, so on the left here, you can see the plot of various localities. Uh, on the horizontal axis, there's a distance to the uh, hurricane at any stage during its progression, and on the vertical one is the activity. So you can see that roughly there is a, a trend to decrease the activity with the distance away from the hurricane, and the distance stops playing any role uh, at about, let's say, 10 to 20 uh, decimal degrees of latitude longitude which corresponds to this latitudes of the United States, roughly to, let's say, 1,500 kilometers. Uh, the color of the labels is basically the proximity. So you can see that uh, the red or affected locations are basically uh, registering a very high level of proximity. Uh, the other pattern that could be observed is actually uh, some sort of a triadic link between the activity uh, originality of the content, or basically the fraction of the uh, original messages rather than repeated messages, and the popularity of the content created locally. So for the keywords that are, are clearly related to the disaster itself, like that specifically sandy or hurricane or flooding, you can see this nice uh, and almost linear relationship between the activity and repeat ratio. So the higher activity is, the lower repeat ratio. So the uh, areas that are affected and highly active, uh, they primarily create content rather than consume it. Uh, and uh, for the obvious reasons, the same affected and highly active areas, uh, they also enjoy high popularity of the content created locally, meaning that it gets repeated elsewhere more than uh, more than in unaffected places. Uh, so that holds true to a couple of, uh, I'm just showing the example of a couple of other keywords. As I said, the event-related keywords all show this particular trend, uh, like hurricane or, uh, that's the example of the effect keywords, no power, flooding, and so on. And here, an example of a couple of uh, uh, tags that are not specifically associated with the hurricane, like, for instance, weather or climate. Uh, and you can see that the distribution is more or less spread all over. Uh, so the take-home message here is that basically proximity is the primarily indicator or explanatory variable in rationalizing the uh, online behavior. Uh, this is just an alternative way of representing the same information. So on the horizontal axis, the uh, urban areas are basically filtered by, uh, uh, ranked by their proximity, this closest on the left, and the keywords are ranked uh, from top to down by their activity in New York uh, at that particular time. So we're looking at the landing day right here, and you can see that the top left corner uh, is the region of the highest uh, possible activity. And that essentially uh, sums up what I uh, was presenting before, that basically it is a combination of the uh, proximity and high relevance of the keyword to the event we're looking at. Uh, in terms of how the information gets retrieved, uh, so this particular matrix, it, it's a, bit, a little bit messy, but uh, so what we have here is, again, localities are sorted by the proximity to uh, disaster. Uh, the color represents the fraction of uh, retweeted messages originating from that particular location. So basically, if we're looking at the row, the first row, for instance, the Philadelphia, I believe. Uh, so the color within this row represents the uh, fraction of uh, 
retreats originating from New York, Washington, and so on and so forth. Uh, so you can see that the diagonal is basically uh, dominating this distribution. So more or less all the uh, locations demonstrate a local focus of attention. Uh, plus there are dominant verticals, and those correspond usually to three things. The, it's either the affected location, or again, the relevance is a three. Uh, if a disaster happens somewhere in uh, Northeast, like New York and Philadelphia, those would uh, actually be the sources for retreating. Uh, plus, uh, centers of influence also demonstrate this high activity, like uh, places like Washington and the LA. Uh, the same is obvious for, for the different uh, work. For instance, if we look at climate change, again, there is a dominant diagonal showing the kind of self, uh, self absorption of local focus. Uh, plus, the dominant verticals in this particular case is it's for Washington being the dominant center and the uh, west coast uh, cities like LA and uh, San Francisco and Seattle. Uh, apparently those are communities quite concerned, especially Seattle, quite concerned and uh, kind of forward looking in terms of the uh, climate change. So uh, it basically shows the focus on the uh, trend setting places in a sense. Uh, this one uh, is a distribution of the uh, retreats or the changes in the distribution of retreats uh, by the account. Uh, so as, as many characteristics in the, in the online activity, you can see here the approximate power law, uh, maybe in a bit exponentially truncated form. Uh, so unfortunately, we don't have much data for the, for the regions uh, except the very populous uh, region in California and, uh, and the Northeast. Uh, so the meaningful comparisons could only be done, let's say, between the Northeast and California. And it's a little bit hard to see here, but if you look at the long uh, or high retreat count and so these plots, you can see that the behavior is different. So as a baseline, uh, you can take the distribution for the uh, overall data set. And, uh, and then look at what happens uh, with the increased or decreased level of activity depending on the stage of the hurricane. So you can see that for the, for the Northeast, uh, the one which is above the overall general trend <coughs> is the uh, landing day. So effectively, uh, right in the tip of the, of the event, uh, the information which was generated in the Northeast was very successful in being redistributed. Uh, and it seems like it was successful uh, almost at the expense of the information generated elsewhere. It was, uh, if you look at the California, you can actually see the uh, drop in the success rate for the uh, post landing information generated there. Uh, so all in all, if I try to summarize this overview, overview section, what we have is uh, is very simple observation that the primary explanatory variable is relevance, and in this particular case, it best expressed through the proximity to the disaster. Uh, we also see that content creation and consumption are in a bit of an inverse re relationship, uh, where activity is high, the retreat rate is usually low. Uh, and uh, activity is also related to the popularity of the content. And lastly, retreating behavior shows the local focus and the focus to the uh, centers of influence, these uh, kind of populous, economically uh, important areas or politically important areas like Washington. Uh, <clears throat> so with this in mind, uh, we can proceed to the last section of this talk. Uh, and that's more specific study, uh, trying to look at what could be done about uh, the data on social media in terms of uh, using it in disaster context, maybe for developing the earlier warning system or estimating how beneficial it is to be plugging and participate actively uh, in the social network if, you, if you're trying to benefit 
So we're going to be looking at the uh, so-called sensor method, which takes origin in the so-called friendship paradox. Uh, this paradox is a, is a phenomenon first noticed in the social sciences by the uh, sociologist uh, Scott Feld, uh, who was studying the uh, social network in the high school uh, in states. And what he discovered uh, could basically be summarized colloquially as your friends, on average, have more friends than you do. Uh, and uh, although his original primary focus was uh, basically more on the sociological implications of this phenomenon uh, and the freedom of uh, inadequate social inclusion, for instance, uh, it got quickly picked up in other fields uh, as an easy and almost no-cost method of uh, developing a sensor group with the performance better than random. So if we're using the friends of the random people instead of themselves, and if these people are more connected or more central in the network, then we might reasonably hope that they are uh, exposed to the earlier detection of anything traveling through the network, be it information or some material entity like virus. Uh, this, uh, a couple of seminal works, uh, the, the first and most famous is by Chris Atis and Fowler, who implemented this idea uh, on, the, on the social network uh, with regard to the detection of the flu outbreak. And what they found is that, yes, the method works, uh, and uh, you can have a group of volunteers who nominate their friends, and the friends, the sensor group, they uh, can have they can detect the onset of the epidemic uh, by nearly two weeks in advance of the, of the control group. Uh, later, different researchers in, uh, sort of extended the concept to different fields. It's been shown that the friendship paradox actually works uh, in the citation network. It works for the uh, properties like popularity and uh, activity of users in online social media and uh, our own Manuel Cibran, uh, he showed basically that the same applies uh, for the distribution of hashtags and uh, uh, Twitter. Uh, so the scope of our project was uh, essentially try to figure out whether, whether the method works in context of the disaster. And if it does, what sort of advantage the sensor group has over the random control group? Uh, so on this slide, uh, you can see the characteristic plotted as a function of the entry time for our users uh, in the data set. Uh, so basically, we're looking at the all users who first post the message uh, around a particular time on the horizontal scale. And then we look at the mean characteristics of all such users, like the mean activity and mean number of, uh, median number of friends and followers. And you can see that uh, activity is strongly related to the entry time. But uh, that, that is not surprising, because basically the earlier you enter the data set, the more time you have for, for, for tweeting on the topic. But what's more interesting uh, is that uh, network centrality characteristics are related uh, in the same manner. So the earlier you appear in our data set, the more friends and followers you have. So it's kind of a tentative uh, uh, preliminary result that supports the hypothesis that, yes, if, if you look at more connected individuals, uh, you can expect that they will detect information earlier. So all the study was essentially about implementing the sensor method on our data set. Uh, the work is quite simple. So what you do is you randomly select a sample. Uh, you then randomly for each user of our control samples select the uh, one follower. And in such a way, you compose two groups. The control one uh, consisting of random people and the sensor one consisting of their friends. Uh, the groups are of the same size and without uh, duplication. Uh, so on the slide here, you can see the typical histograms of activity. So there's two things to be noted. First of all, the 
sensor group has high activity, so the, the, the blue trend is higher. Uh, but what's more important that the cumulative distribution function actually demonstrate this left shift. So not only uh, you have higher level of activity, it happened earlier on average for the sensor people. Uh, so the natural question to ask is how much of the lagging or how much of the lead time in the awareness we see here. And what we've done is <coughs> we basically answered exactly this question uh, and in a slightly more complicated way uh, by taking into account the geography as well. So we, we bring these two things. First of all is a kind of uh, control and sensor relationship and then we, we can also look at the four geographical combinations of, of this effect because we know the area of the hurricane which we take as a, uh, essentially the outline of the area of the uh, category one uh, strength winds. Uh, and uh, each user, uh, or basically uh, each group can, uh, we have four combinations. So our control and sensor are either within the affected area or outside of it, or to opposing combination. One is within, the other one without, is out. Uh, so on the left here is uh, lead time defined as basically the difference between the average entry time detected over the sensor group minus average entry time of the control group. So if our sensors detect the information earlier, uh, then this magnitude would be negative. So you can see that uh, basically for all combinations uh, except the green one it holds true. So the, uh, there is a lead time. The scale of this lead time varies uh, depending on the other factors, uh, specifically the geography. Uh, the advantage is rather moderate. Uh, if, if we do not uh, take the geography in, into account, and that's the black trend in the middle, we're looking at the lead time varying between minus 10 and minus 5 hours. Uh, the largest warning time could be expected for the combination of two things. Uh, the first one is the network centrality, so our sensor uh, people detect the information earlier. And the second one is a geographical relevance. We can select our sensors uh, from the affected area. So that's the purple trend uh, at the bottom of the panel A. And you can see that sort of the, the, the best you can squeeze out of the method is on the scale of roughly a day, a weekend, 23, 24 hours. Uh, it is rather interesting that uh, the relevance is actually outperforms uh, network connectivity because uh, if, if, if you have your control random group selected from the affected area and sensors from the unaffected area, then instead of the lead time, you have a lag time. So the relevance always beats the, the network performance in this case. Uh, so we know the scale of the advantage we're getting. The other question was, uh, are these groups different in any, in any other way rather than in the activity uh, and, and the time they latched on, on the topic. So we started looking at the sentiment. Uh, and uh, on the left you can see the sentiment trends, uh, the average sentiment as, as, as the time progresses. And basically the active stage of the hurricane is uh, uh, characterized by the dip into the area of the negative sentiment which lasts roughly from minus 100 to 100 hours. Um, and it is detected uh, basically regardless of the, of the location. Uh, what's also interesting is there is no uh, horizontal shift between the two groups. So there is no uh, time offset in terms of the emotional uh, response between the users, between the control and sensor. So the emotional response should, appears to be universal. And uh, at the very basic level, this dip into the negativity happens uh, uh, due to the change in the composition of the screen. Essentially, people post more negative messages at the expense of the, of the positive ones. Uh, the only effect of the distance and the location uh, is basically the magnitude of the response. 
uh, if on the, on the left plot you would look at the panels F and G, you can see that uh, one trend is generally above the other. Uh, and uh, the one which is more negative is, you, uh, is basically the group which uh, is in the disaster affected area. Uh, so this behavior actually opens up a possibility to use sentiment itself as a sensing tool. So if you look at the average sentiment, or rather its deviation from the, uh, from the normal uh, trend, which would oscillate depending on the time of day, uh, but, but on the highest level, you can measure these abnormal deviations. This jumps into the negativity in themselves, they kind of pinpoint not only that something abnormal happens, but also where exactly it happens. And uh, as an example, you can see the kind of progression of the hurricane and the distribution of sentiment of the United States. So the, the, the top panel shows uh, the 20 peaks of the October when the, when the hurricane just passed in the Caribbean states. Uh, and the, the only area of the negativity is Florida. And that, that's probably because of the proximity and the cultural links to the, to the Caribbean region. Uh, <coughs> But uh, when the hurricane is actually approaching the uh, northeast of the United States, you can nicely see how the, how the area lights up negatively. Uh, so uh, that basically opens up the possibility of implementing the sensing technique, uh, which is insensitive to, to the topic in a sense. All you need to do is to monitor your random sample for the for the negativity in sentiment, you don't need to uh, sort of proactively define what is it specifically you're looking at. Is it a forest fire? Is it flooding? Is it a flood? Is it an earthquake or anything? So sentiment in itself appears to be quite a uh, useful variable uh, for that purpose. And uh, that basically concludes my talk. So if I to summarize quickly uh, that the online activity during disaster is rationalized in terms of the relevance and in, in this particular case it's best expressed as a, as a simple distance or proximity to the hurricane affected area. Uh, the sensor method, uh, it works, it provides a moderate uh, information or awareness advantage, um, but the value of this advantage is, is somewhat questionable. Because we're only looking at uh, roughly uh, the lead times on the scale of hours, maximum a day, and, and we're talking about the event that unfolds for roughly a week. Um, that is not to say that the method is completely useless, because for, for other events without extended warning time, uh, it could behave probably differently. For instance, uh, it definitely would behave differently in case where the uh, network serves as the uh, information source itself rather than the reflection of what goes on uh, in, the, in the wider broadcasting media as we, as we have in this particular case because we're looking at the, at the sense at the exogenous process uh, so the information is uh, not originating and spreading uh, specifically within the network basically reflected uh, from, from the external sources. Uh, and the last uh, observation is the, the value of this sentiment as a, as a sensing tool. And uh, on this I would like to acknowledge my collaborators on the, uh, on the project, uh, Manuel, Pascal, and uh, especially Caron, who, who basically provided all the, all the data support. Uh, and that's all. Thank you very much. For for coming and tuning in. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yuri. Do we have any, any questions on the other side of the camera? Yes. I have a question. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. I have two questions. One is related to the data you presented at the beginning. Uh, yes, yes. 
how exactly you measure the relevance of particular keywords. Uh, if you can go back to the slides where you showed uh, linearity between the most, uh, between the popularity of the keyword, yes, here. Yes. So for, for some of the keywords, you, uh, you are obviously getting uh, co uh, correlation between the popularity and activity, a uh, clear co uh, correlation, but for some others, you, you don't get this kind of correlation, like uh, you mentioned weather and, or, and something else, I think. Uh, yes, there's a couple of other, like uh, climate, for instance, uh, uh, things like uh, say, as I remember correctly, and, uh, the, because our net was cast pretty wide, we have, uh, we have a lot of keywords, and not all of them naturally specifically related to this particular event. I, I understand uh, that. My question is more related to, for those particular words like weather, weather or climate, do you measure them in the context <coughs> of, of uh, more popular words like sandy, hurricane, or just you measure them, uh, you measure their popularity or artifaction uh, as individual words appearing in the messages? Uh, okay, the characteristics here, uh, the popularity, for instance, are uh, yep. basically <clears throat> in itself is uh, it's a normalized volume uh, of the retweets. So, if, for instance, uh, the messages from this particular location, let's say we talk about New York, and in New York. There's, let's say, 50,000 uh, 50, messages uh, mentioning climate. Of those, let's say, 5,000 is uh, uh, retweeted elsewhere. So the popularity, as we define it, is basically the uh, count of the retweeted messages divided by the number of users they originate from. So it's uh, normalized by the uh, origin uses uh, volume of retweeted messages. Okay, Does I that understand. Answer your question? Um, yes, it answers my question. However, I think uh, it's uh, important because imagine all these messages collected, you are normalizing them by the uh, location of the, of the users. However, imagine that all these messages are, are, for example, messages like the weather is good. I mean, uh, messages that do not uh, contain uh, very important keywords like hurricane or, or uh, sandy or... Uh, uh, you understand my point? So, yes, so, yes. so you, you, I think it's more relevant to get uh, normalization with respect to both location of the users and the semantics of the messages. Uh, <coughs> yes, yeah, rather uh, than only uh, uh, locations. I understand your point. So uh, in, in these particular examples, I was trying to essentially describe uh, this correlation of how the proximity affects the uh, overall behavior in, in terms of activity and popularity. And uh, we basically see that these trends are different for the relevant and non-relevant okay. words. And uh, in the sections of the study where we can, uh, where we actually try to, uh, to get the uh, quantitative measures of the advantage uh, in the lead time, for instance, in the sensor method. We're dealing specifically with the messages that we know related to the hurricane. Okay, so okay. That was I was calling the relevance filter. We, okay. We look at the Sandy and we discard all the noise. Okay, okay, that's all right. Um, and uh, this my second question is related uh, to your final part of the presentation, which yes. was... Uh, about uh, positive and negative messages. So how you determine whether a message is uh, positive or negative? Uh, okay, uh, 
because this appears to be very important part for determining the sentiment which can be used for actually predicting where where the the hurricane will will appear will yes. occur uh, well uh, probably not where it will appear uh, because that's pretty much well known for from the general meteorological forecasting uh, but in case of other fast facing disasters like maybe the, the terror yes. or, or the flash flood and the forest fire, it might potentially be used as a sensing tool. So coming back to your question about the uh, source of the sentiment measure, so yes. what we have, our, our original data is actually bought from the analytics company, uh, from, from the top selects, uh, and they provided us with a, with a measure of sentiment for every particular message. Uh, the problem with that is their, their method was proprietary. We don't really know the nuts and bolts of what they've done in detecting the sentiment. So what we did, we actually verified that by using two alternative sentiment uh, detection tools. And those are uh, so-called loop, uh, linguistic inquiry and the work done at library, which is widely okay. used in, in psychology and sociology. Uh, okay. and the other one is so-called Senti Strength Library by Mike Pelvo. Uh, that is the tool developed for dealing with uh, short online messages, uh, taking into account uh, non-verbal markers as well, like the emoticons and so on, all the, all the non-sentence spelling ubiquitous in the social network. Uh, all these things, uh, they, they do paint essentially the same picture. The trends are the same, uh, except for uh, slight vertical shift and, and the scale, of course, because they uh, uh, approach it in a different fashion. So the Topsy one, is basically the dictionary approach. You have the dictionaries of positively and negatively charged words. Uh, and whenever in a message the, the, there's a word detected, it gets assigned the corresponding score. Uh, those are summed up across the message and normalized by the, uh, by the length of the message. So that's essentially our understanding of the proxy method. Uh, except that we don't exactly have the, the dictionaries, so, so we don't really know the, the internals uh, of the approach. Uh, loop uh, actually uses, uh, pretty much they all use the same approach. The, the differences are in the, in the dictionaries themselves, uh, okay. in, the in the methods of uh, kind of human validation of the the efficiency of, of this library. Okay. Uh, but what we found, they, they all perform reasonably well, and uh, the trends are very consistent with each other. So, okay. in a sense, it becomes a question of personal preference, what you would like to use, or what, what do you have an access to. Okay, yes, of course. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have another question in the camera? Uh, Yuri, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can okay. hear you. Okay. Yeah, I have a question. Could you go to the slides where you talk about, uh, where you have the plots of lead time? Um, I'm, so, I'm sorry, could you repeat that again? Uh, could you go to the slides where you talk about the lead times, where you have plotted the lead times in this case? Like the fourth or fifth time from here. Yeah. Uh, so if I understand yes. it correctly, this is one lead time for the complete control and sensor group. It's not like for a particular keyword or a hashtag, right? Uh, sorry, once again? Hey, I, th I think you're not talking in the right microphone. We have a very really strange echo here. Uh, there is usually another microphone in that room. Um, uh, can you hear now? I'll try to be a little louder. Probably the microphone will be there, so we'll okay. just keep loud. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, can yeah. you maybe try to talk a bit slower? <laughs> okay. So, if I understand it correctly, 
This is one lead time for the complete control and sensor group, not uh, group by hashtag or keyword, right? Uh, this particular example is a lead time with respect to the Sandy. Uh, Sandy specifically, we're not looking at anything else but the kind of keyword Sandy. Okay, so, uh, so well, here if you look at yeah, here if you look at the number of tweets in the control group and sensor group, I would assume that since sensor groups are more active, the size in terms of number of tweets of sensor groups would be larger than control groups, right? Uh, the, the size of the group is the same, so the, the uh, size in terms of number of tweets, not number of users. Oh, yes, 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 you're right, of, of course. The sensor group usually posts more uh, than the control group. Yeah, so in that case, uh, statistically, I would assume the lead time uh, would be, like the first use would be before the control group, and anyways, the lead time should come out to be negative, irrespective of what the users are. Uh, Yes, uh, uh, so, so basically there's a, uh, uh, there's a possible explanation uh, to our results in terms of simply uh, frequency components of it. Because uh, the individuals in the sensor group are shown to be more active, they basically, the frequency of their messages uh, is higher than that for the for the control group. Therefore, any event happening would, would essentially be reported earlier by the by the sensor people than, than the control one. And that is a valid assumption. And that exactly what, what we've done in our comparison with the new model. Uh, I skip this part I, given my talk, but we actually compared our results for the overall sampling with a new model where the timestamps are randomly shuffled. Uh, so we, we essentially trying to disconnect the effect of the uh, frequency and centrality. Uh, and what we found is that new model is actually outperforming our data in terms of the lead time you would expect. Uh, now the question is uh, the question is whether it's only the frequency effect or it's a little bit of both. And to be honest with you, we don't know because, in, in, in my opinion, there is no adequate new model uh, to correctly disconnect the two. Uh, because the Sharpman, what, what it actually does uh, is if you, if, if you look at this as a, as a closed data set, and let's say you shuffle your timestamp, and that's basically the best what you can do with the, with the data on hand. Uh, or you can use some other empirical distribution. The uniform yeah, if, 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 if you have the, the size of the control and sensor group in terms of number of tweets, would some subsampling them, uh, the sensor group, and bring it, bring it equal to the control group or something? Uh, excuse me, I, did, I, I didn't quite get that. So you're suggesting that we, we try to equalize the size of the groups in terms of the tweet, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. In, in terms of the tweet volume. Uh, it, might be, it might be an interesting comparison. Honestly, we, we haven't done that. It, it might be an interesting suggestion. Thank you.